I think where I'm really interested in some of these AI tools is where does the student get brought into it? Yeah. I think that's where you get in trouble with some of these AI tools is you don't want it to be just so that teachers can create new stuff in the old way. You want to look for tools that actually address some of the core mission-driven goals you have and that can actually help you realize some of the innovations you've been hoping for for years when the tools technology hasn't really been available. Welcome to the Unruler Podcast, where we um, interview students, educators, and um, education leaders that are on the forefront of both innovation, but also on the forefront of making schools more human-centered. Um, I'm excited to share a new segment of our podcast, which is all about AI and education, that myself and Evan Harris will be collaborating on. Um, Evan, we have our first guest in this series, and I'd love for we you do. to introduce him. Yeah. So I, I first became familiar with Eric through LinkedIn. It's a relatively small community of people who facilitate uh, professional development that's very AI focused, and maybe even a smaller community of people who are really focused on doing that at independent schools. I attended an independent school uh, at Mercersburg Academy in high school, taught at independent schools for 10 years. Um, so I was really interested to talk with Eric Hudson because you have been on the ground uh, for months now at these schools, getting questions, hearing about their challenges, their priorities. Uh, so I thought, who better to kind of give us the lay of the land? Um, so I'd love to hear uh, just, uh, you know, how you got into this, a little bit about how you made that transition from English teacher to PD facilitator, why independent schools, just whatever you'd like to start with. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having me, guys. Um, so I spend my career in education. Um, first 12 years out of college, I was a classroom teacher in, in independent schools, uh, mostly middle school and high school English and journalism. Uh, and then in 2013, I moved out of the classroom and started working for a global online academy. It's a nonprofit organization. They do passion-based online courses for high school students and professional development for educators and school leaders. And my role at GOA when I started was instructional coach training mm -hmm. in-person, independent, mostly independent school teachers in how to design and facilitate high quality online courses um, for high school students. And that's really where my interests as a classroom teacher who was always into technology and sort of intersected with professional development of adults. And I spent 10 years at GOA in a variety of roles, um, most recently as chief program officer. And then I left GOA after a great 10 years at the end of July, uh, just looking to make a professional transition. And I'm on my own as a consultant. And um, when I left GOA, I started my Substack Learning on Purpose just as a way to sort of keep myself thinking and writing. And, you know, it was the time when AI was very much on everyone's minds. And as a person who's sort of spent his career at the intersection of technology and teaching, I felt like I had something to say and there was a lot of stuff I wanted to learn. And so that's how I sort of got into the AI work. And that's turned into, as you mentioned, a lot of sort of really interesting interactions and partnerships with schools and learning organizations. Hmm. I love that. And in many ways, it's exciting to interview you because you're seeing at a school level, both schools freaking out and being excited. You know, and, you know, as you travel to independent schools this fall and you're leading PD sessions on the topic, could you highlight a few school policies or practices that have impressed? Yeah, I mean, I think in general, you know, when ChatGPT came out a little more than a year ago, I was still GOA and I think freaking out was like the right phrase for the yeah. first <laughs> like six to eight months of it. And something I've noticed since I've been on my own is a real shift away from that sort of like panic, defensiveness towards a much more open stance, a much more of a learning stance at schools. Um, we want to know what this is. We want to know how it works. Um, we want to know use cases for it that go beyond cheating. And I think in general, at the independent schools I've interacted with, that's a really positive shift. Where I'm seeing some really interesting stuff is um, schools who are thinking about not just teacher uses, but student uses. So 
uh, school whose policy I looked at, they're trying to devise kind of a red, yellow, green protocol for students around how to approach thinking about using AI. Um, red is obviously never use it. Yellow is maybe collaborate with an adult. And green is, yeah, you can make this decision for yourself. And I think those sorts of you know policies and procedures that build AI literacy in students are the ones that are most exciting to me because I think literacy is the most important thing for both students and adults when it comes to AI. Right now, I'm not sure we need to force people to love it or hate it. Um, right now, it's just evolving too quickly for that. But I do think it's important that we are informed consumers of it. And so I'm really excited about schools who are working directly with students on building that literacy and building that competency with it. Yeah, I agree with you that um, that student-centered approach is really important, uh, not only maybe in sort of the development of policy, but also kind of in the, what is the mechanism for student feedback after the policy has been implemented? How can this be an ongoing conversation where students have some agency? And I think, too, that, um, you know, there is, in the same way that you would never want a school to just copy and paste another school's policy, so much of the benefit in devising a policy is in that conversation about what does this mean? What does this say about who we are? And inviting students into that conversation is so important because they can, it's transparency. They can understand the why behind why things are. And that can be at a very high level or like you're saying, sort of assignment by assignment. Well, why does a human have to do this? Or why does the AI get to do this? And what does that mean for sort of our learning experience? Totally. I mean, I totally agree. I, I say to schools all the time, like your policy is a beginning, not an ending. I mean, mm -hmm. policies are lived out and figured out in the interactions between teachers and students. And so your policy is not really rules or to do so much as it is like constraints for a conversation, constraints on the conversation you want teachers to be having with students and vice mm -hmm. versa. So, you know, I just work with a school where we talked about position and policy commitments as opposed to like policy, right? Because there's no way to kind of manualize AI in schools right now. There's no way you can anticipate what it will look like three, six, 12 months from now. And I think the best thing schools can do is be very explicit and very clear with their communities about what their position is on AI. Are we open to it? Do we want to learn about it? And then also what are they committing to policy wise? You know, how will you think about academic integrity issues, issues of equity and inclusion, uh, vendor vetting? You know, mm. that you can't sort of dictate all the details of those things, but you can provide your community with some constraints and some direction in how they can start talking about it in a productive way. You know, you've, you're building a practice as you visit schools as a consultant. I want to give a little bit of your practice away for free, just for a second. Um, and then this is why people listen to things like this, right? Like, you know, what what is a key tactical piece of advice or tip that you're giving to teachers and school leaders? For teachers, you know, I the sort of thing I say ad nauseum is like the best way to make sense of AI is to use it. And so for teachers... Um, I just, I, the first thing any teacher can do on their own, um, with access to any of these chat bots is feed AI, one of your assignments and see how it does and really reflect on the response you get and reflect mm -hmm. on, um, how good the output is and what the output says about not just AI, but says about your assignment. Um, and think about that piece of it. For school leaders, I think it's a little different. Um, they still need to educate themselves for sure. Um, but I always tell them, you need to talk to students. You need to treat your mm -hmm. students as resources on artificial intelligence, learn about what their experience with it is, learn about what they're talking about with their families um, about AI, and make sure that your sort of policy and position and communications are kind of grounded in what students are experiencing um, because, you know, I think school leaders are hearing a lot from teachers about AI right now, getting a lot of questions, a lot of opinions, having a lot of conversations. So I try to encourage them to make time to talk to students about it too. It's interesting. I mean, that makes me think about during COVID, how a lot of us thought 
Now is the time for student-centered learning. Oh, wow. School leaders, parents, students will understand the power of passion projects. Will understand the power of connecting real-world learning skills to you know work in the community or outside of it. And most of us were pretty disappointed. I think there were great things that happened, but the, the silver lining, right, that people thought would happen did not. And with AI, what I'm hoping for and really excited about is that it does what you just said. It calls into question the kind of bull assignments and schema yeah. and curriculum that kids have been faking before AI, that they were using Cliff Notes for, or they were crowdsourcing information or going on a Discord channel to find it. And so I love that. I love like, AI also thinking about as an educator and teacher, what assignments are meaningful to your learners and which ones actually showcase metacognition or critical thinking or at least key learning skills. Yeah. And, you know, I, I hear you on the, the pandemic education stuff. I mean, what was really hard about that was it was a completely traumatizing disruption <laughs> to education. I mean, it, you couldn't think of an experience where the conditions were less conducive to change <laughs> than that right and you know i to be honest a lot of the work i'm doing with an ai with ai i'm running into a lot of sort of hangover from pandemic education in that um technology can be triggering for both adults and students for sure um the sort of relentlessness of the last few years in education um have exhausted teachers and i think when it comes to sort of change management and introducing innovation in schools, the rationale has to be really good and really strong. And institutions need to meet their educators halfway in terms of resource allocation and support in order to get teachers to change behavior. You know, I always enter my partnerships assuming that teachers want to do the best work possible and assuming that they're willing to grow. And nothing has ever led me to believe differently but the conditions and the circumstances can make that growth really hard. And that's where I think, you know, th what you're talking about sort of let's talk about the assessment and not just the technology that gets teachers, in my experience, more engaged because the assessment is theirs. It's not something that's being imposed upon them, which is how this uh, this AI stuff and pandemic education, if you can get them talking about the meaning of the things they create um, I find that there's a little bit more of an incentive to to think differently about it. You know, Eric, I'm really interested. You, you were talking about sort of the degree to which this is a kind of emotionally charged issue for a lot of teachers. And a lot of that is for good reason. Like you said, kind of coming out of the pandemic, having a certain amount of ed tech fatigue. There's some stats about like something like half of all ed tech that gets purchased never gets used. And so a huge percentage of teachers say that it causes more work than it sort of saves time. Um, and certainly teachers are looking at their students sort of inundated by social media and technology and the impact that has on their mental health. So the idea of doing more kind of tech PD can just seem overwhelming. I'm wondering how you think about sort of empathically validating that emotion while also listening for those maybe less founded concerns about, uh, I heard AI is coming for my job. Like I, I heard they're replacing us. That kind of the anxiety that's where you can sort of say, well, wait a second, uh, that's that's maybe less less founded, while still kind of being empathic with that. So like how how do you think about sort of managing the emotions of all of this? Yeah, um, I think that there's certain schools of thought around AI that don't work when you're working directly with teachers. So for example the world is changing, you have to adapt, is not, you know, as much as we believe that to be true, that's a really hard in with a teacher who's just, in a lot of cases, just trying to get through the day, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, I think the best thing you can do when you're working directly with classroom educators is respect their expertise and give them time and space to gain some firsthand experience and absorb some high quality information about, in this case, artificial intelligence. Because when I spend an hour with a faculty working through some hands-on exercises with a chatbot, whatever it is, you know, the fact that it is both powerful and mediocre becomes really clear, right? Like they start to see like, oh, this is not going to steal my job. <laughs> you know, it's mm -hmm. it's really not that good. 
it still requires my content knowledge and my expertise to to get good, right? Like you, I'm a better prompter when I know what I'm talking about. I can evaluate AI's output more effectively when I know what I'm talking about. And so teachers, I think through that hands-on work, begin to see the potential partnership between AI and their expertise. And they start to see that, at least for right now, these tools just require human intervention to work well. And we are nowhere near a place where a classroom educator is going to be replaced by a robot um, in the way that I think a lot of the think pieces are claiming um, is going to happen. I, yeah, I totally agree. Um, I'm really interested in the counterbalance to AI. Um, AI is an incredible way to do research. It's an amazing way to build products, right? You know, what's needed now? Um, how, what, what capacities and tools do we need to be able to capture process, right? And to be able to catch, capture authenticity that can be paired with usage of AI. Yeah, I mean, I think that that was my well, my last Substack was about like well, how are we even defining authenticity? You know, I in that Substack I talked about that Grant Wiggins essay, the futility of trying to teach everything of importance, and you know, I think he defines authenticity as student work, basically. You know, like how how do we get students to do really good work that goes deep on a complicated idea, as opposed to trying to cover a lot of content, right? Mm -hmm. And also where the student is in a position to explain with passion and rigor what their work means and what they learned from it, right? And so there's lots of different ways that AI can play a role in supporting that process. But ultimately, the outcome you're working towards is students internalizing a deep understanding of their work, being able to explain it, and then you know, really kind of celebrating and carrying with them that sense of self-efficacy oh, that, that comes with doing really good, totally hard work yeah. that has yeah. meaning to yeah. them, right? I mean, it's that Dewey quote about experiential education, right? The reflection of the experience is where you're seeing a ton of the learning. I just want to read a little bit from that Substack, which I've read a bunch of times. Yeah. You, on, you conclude with, in AI, we have at our fingertips a reference tool exponentially more powerful than the textbook that can not just help students and teachers locate knowledge when they need it, but can also assist them in identify, identifying and fleshing out the authentic knowledge problems that define expertise in a given field. Of course, AI could be used to short circuit this process um, by presenting work that appears authentic without any actual learning behind it. It can also, as has been well documented, be wrong. Its power is double-edged. I do not see this as a compelling reason to avoid using AI nor do I believe that it's possible to prevent all students from using AI to cheat. I do believe that we can design assessments that achieve Wiggins' goal of sparking the desire to learn while deepening students' understanding of what it means to develop expertise both with and without AI. That is so beautifully said. Thank you for writing. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for quoting me to me. <laughs> <laughs> A deliciously weird experience. Yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah, Eric, I was hoping you just, uh, just like, oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know who wrote that, but he's, yeah. he's good. Um, Eric, I'm curious about, you know, uh, whether it was sort of the EU commission report or this Australian framework that's come out or um, even the sort of big tech companies themselves, virtually all of them are sort of in general agreement that a prerequisite for using AI in the classroom is uh, some understanding of sort of the ethical and safety challenges around AI whether that's uh, sort of bias in the output, hallucinations, I would even sort of include environmental impact and labor, labor exploitation and sort of content moderation and those kinds of things predominantly in the global south. So I'm, I'm curious, um, you know, it's, in my opinion, it's much easier to understand those things if you have even sort of a basic knowledge of what are these systems, how are they trained, like what is this stuff? At the same time, you know, you don't want to overwhelm faculty with a lot of technical knowledge. So how do you kind of split the difference between not wanting to overwhelm with stuff that's, you know, going to kind of be over people's heads and may turn them off to learning versus wanting them to have some basic knowledge of what these systems are and how they're trained so that you can start to connect those dots for faculty? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the good, 
the good news is that because AI is so trendy, there's just like an enormous amount of content that's been produced right. around AI, right? And so literally in terms of how the tool works, I mean, The Guardian and uh, Financial Times have a couple of multimedia visualizations of how these neural networks work, what happens when you input something. And like, it takes five minutes to watch those and you learn enormous amount from these visualizations. And I think those sort of like, media pieces can be really helpful to give you that sort of surface level exploration of it. Um, the, I'm in the middle of The Worlds I See, which is Fei-Fei Li's uh, memoir. She runs the Human Centered AI Institute at Stanford. And she does, I'm actually thinking about using excerpts of it with teachers. She does a really beautiful job. Her She is sort of one of the founders of some of these data sets that or figuring out how AI gets trained off of data. And she does a really beautiful job explaining that these tools are trained to quote unquote see in the way that we see with our own eyes. And it's a really powerful analogy because when you start to think about how you yourself see and learn from what you see, it becomes that much clearer to you how these AI tools are learning from scraping all this data. They're looking for connections. They're looking for layers. It's actually a really lovely analogy. And I think if we can find clear analogies, suitable metaphors, some like sort of multimodal ways to learn, you can really get people into it. It is actually interesting. And again, I go back to like the goal here is not to get you to use it every day with your students. The goal is to learn about it so you can gain a little knowledge and feel sort of a little more empowered when new AI things come your way. And I do find, you know, teachers are learners. I, in my experience, they are interested in sort of learning about some of the nuts and bolts of the process. Hmm. My last question, um, there's a beautiful LinkedIn post by Mike Yates, um, and he talked about ed tech that props up the status quo of education and ed tech that disrupts it and allows for new things to be possible. And my biggest disappointment with AI is that the vast majority of AI and AI, AI ed tech companies prop up the status quo. They might they make life a little easier for teachers, but they don't challenge the things that I think a lot of us want to see challenged. Um, and you know, I'm interested in how you advise schools on the ed tech side and just on the AI side on not just finding something that's going to make someone's life a little easier but something that's going to allow the actual innovation that we've been seeking. And actually, innovation is kind of the, uh, the wrong word. A human-centered approach, right? Like mm -hmm. the ways that maybe our grandparents learned in apprenticeships and craftsmanships, like a, a more communal approach to learning. How, how are you advising schools in that space? I mean, again, I totally agree with you. I think a lot of the tools that are popping up right now around AI, these are basically just like skins built over GPT. 100%. Very simple yeah. user interfaces. 100%. Really yeah. And so um, I, it goes back to sort of intention and purpose, right? Like what's the pedago pedagogical problem you're trying to solve at your school? Like that, like what, how do you want your academic program to be different like what is what about the student experience what's your wish list for the student experience at your school and that's how you should be vetting these tools it goes back i, mean, I don't know if you guys remember like the samr model from like back mm -hmm. in the day right mm -hmm. it's like you know what stage of the samr model are you at if you're just looking to perpetuate the existing system then i would argue you shouldn't purchase these tools these some of these tools at all totally. like just allow yeah. Your, your institution to carry itself forward and write a policy that puts some strict guidelines on AI. I think where I'm really interested in some of these AI tools is where does the student get brought into it? Yeah, totally. So many of these tools are built for teachers and their workflow, which is fine. You know, that's valid. But that to me does not address some of the core issues in education that we're talking about, which revolve around student empowerment, student motivation, you know, being responsive to the world beyond school. Those are all things that require students to have access to the platform, to be able to use the platform for their own purposes and not for this tool to kind of, for teachers to use it to kind of spit out robot generated artifacts that students are then supposed to complete, right? I think that's where you get in trouble with some of these AI tools is you don't want it to be 
just so that teachers can create new stuff in the old way, right? You want to look for tools that actually address some of the core mission-driven goals you have for your institution. And that can actually, you know, help you realize some of the innovations you've been hoping for for years when the tools technology hasn't really been available to do it, you know, be ambitious, you know, why not be ambitious? Totally. Yeah. Evan, I, I want to, I, I, I want to give you the last question and then Eric, a, a kind of final statement. Sure. Um, so, uh, Eric, you know, I'll, I'll ask you this and I don't mean to put you on the spot. So if you need a second to kind of think about it, this is something I think about sometimes that that's helpful for me as kind of just a mental exercise. So I, I want to pose it to you to, to see what you say, which is if, if I were to say, um, Eric Hudson is, um, a facilitator and a consultant for schools that believe uh, what what is that? Oh, I like what, it, what what is kind of like the thing that you look for maybe in a mission statement or in a culture, a school community where you say that's my kind of school. That's that's the exact kind of school I want to partner with because I'm imagining you know this space is changing so quickly that these are schools you're going to have an ongoing relationship with and that you're thinking you know pretty critically about like well, who is it that I want to be aligned with, what kinds of school cultures. So schools that believe. Um. Yeah, you didn't send me that question in advance. <laughs> no, I, it, for me, everything, you know, this the thing that's driven me ever since I became a teacher is student agency. Like, I am interested in empowered students. All the research shows that if you, that schools should help students develop their identities as empowered learners, right? Mm -hmm. and so your assessment model, the design of your academic program, the way you approach AI, you know, I am interested in empowered learners. You know, I'm not an AI expert. Um, that's not my background, but certainly I approach AI through the lens of how is this a tool that can be used to nurture a student's sense of agency so that they can continue to learn long after they've left your school. I can't think of a more important element of the work of schools than really thinking about that side of it, you know, how do we help students identify themselves as learners and equip them with the competencies they need to learn about whatever they want um, yeah. for their futures? Yeah. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah. What's your clarion call to action for schools mm -hmm. and learning communities? You know, what's your, what's your kind of firebrand kind of message? Um, I mean, it sounds so practical, but like, no. you know, you have a job to do. <laughs> like that's, you know, you're, you, you know, what's the schools have a job to do. And this yeah. goes back to the empowered learners thing, right? Like your job is to prepare students for the world beyond school. And I, that job is changing. And so have you updated the job description lately? Have you updated your resume? Like what's the, like that kind of thing of, you know, it's really important that we are aware of and on, on top of how our job as schools is evolving. And we need to make sense of that and act accordingly. And I hope that, you know, that can feel overwhelming and exhausting for sure. But I, you know, it's just the most important work we do is to, you know, provide kids with the best preparation possible for what happens when school is over. Eric, where can people find you? How can they find out about your work and your services? Yeah. So I think the best thing to do is go to my sub stack. It's called Learning on Purpose. Um, it's free to subscribe. And that is the best way to keep up with my work. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn. I've got a website, erichudson.co. But if you are interested in this conversation about, you know, student agency, learner-centered assessment, you know, with some AI thrown in there, uh, look for my sub stack and subscribe. A huge mahalo for watching. Um, please like, share, um, and please go into the show notes and look at all the different um, pieces of writing and information we're going to include on Eric. Eric, thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much for having me.